We don't fully know God. There's this deep longing in us to worship. There's a spiritual awareness within all of humanity. We're often tempted to make this journey about us rather than about the God we serve. By ignoring God, you never make things better in the long run. Throughout history, man has built large, impressive structures to gods, kings, or to famous people. It's in our nature to want to worship something. And if it isn't the one true God of Scripture, it'll be something or someone else. In today's program, Brett McBride will be continuing our series in the Book of Acts, where the events of Pentecost are connected back to Genesis and the Tower of Babel. It's always a temptation to want to bring God down to our level, to show how we can be like God. But God's way is never ours, and He will always remind us of that, even if it means He has to confuse our plans. This is Living Truth. Good morning. You can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. Two weeks ago, we started a series in the book of Acts, starting at Acts chapter one. We're gonna be looking at Acts over the next few months. And you might be wondering why we're turning to Genesis chapter 11 when we're looking at Acts chapter two. We are gonna be looking at the Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost. But to truly appreciate what God is doing on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit being restored to mankind who is sinful and separated from the life of God, I thought it would be interesting to look at the events of Genesis chapter 11 and 12 and touch on some of the themes throughout the whole of the Old Testament because it provides us a backdrop to what God is doing in Acts chapter two and why it's such a significant event in human history. When I was a child growing up in Tottenham, my home backed on a conservation area. So I had farm fields to look out upon. And I used to love taking pieces of paper like this and turning them into treasure maps. I would go into my backyard, I would find some soil and I would rub it into the white paper trying to make it look like an old pirate map. And I would take whatever change I had, whatever trinkets I had, and I would fill a compass box. You remember those math sets? I don't even know if they sell them anymore. I would take a compass box and put my little childhood treasures in it and then I would go bury it in my backyard or I would hide it somewhere on the property and I used to draw these elaborate maps that would lead me back to the treasure that was buried there. Certainly if my dad's weeding the lawn right now, he might be finding some boxes that I didn't manage to find because I lost the map or just simply forgot about as I got older. But I share that because I find studying God's word, sometimes we're so casual with what we hold in our hand, but it is filled with hidden treasure. And my hope this morning is that as we look at Genesis 11 and 12, there's a hidden treasure that we discover of what God has been doing all across human history, preparing for Acts chapter two. And what I wanna look at this morning is the plans of man, the plan of God, and the promise that he himself fulfilled. Before we read from Genesis 11, let me just give you a quick survey of human history up to the events that we're about to read about. God creates man and he places him within the garden. We all know this story if you've been in Sunday school. And God gives man one command as he is in the Garden of Eden, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day that you eat of it, you will most certainly die. We all know the story that our adversary, the devil, Satan, comes in the form of a serpent and tempts Eve to eat from the tree that was forbidden. And Satan makes a promise to Eve as he's tempting her. He says, you will be like God when you eat of this fruit. 
And of course, we know the story. Eve succumbs to the temptation. Adam, who is with her, follows suit. And sin enters the human condition. And God's promise that on the day you eat of this, you will most certainly die comes to pass. Although they didn't die physically, the life of God, the spirit of God, was removed from mankind. The spiritual death was immediate. The physical and moral death would manifest itself over time. And certainly, we look around, and that truth still plays out today. Our bodies are in decay. My body is not what it was when I was born. We are all in varying stages of decay. We can deny it, we can defy it, but it will pass inevitably. And so sin enters the human condition, and the sinfulness of man becomes so great that within five chapters, Actually, within three chapters of Scripture, mankind's violence and sin has become so great that God decides to send a flood and rid the earth of man. But Noah finds favor in his eyes, and God instructs Noah to build a massive ark, which he is obedient to God's call to do so. He builds a massive boat for him and his family, and God sends all the animals of the earth to fill the ark. And so he spares Noah and his family. And in Genesis chapter 9, we read that the floodwaters finally recede. Noah and his family come out of the ark after being in there for about a year. And God establishes a new covenant with man, promising never to flood the earth again. And he blesses Noah and his family, and he says, spread throughout the earth, multiply, and grow upon it and they live under God's blessing. And in Genesis chapter 10, there is a recording of the sons of Noah and their families starting to spread throughout the earth. And we can certainly assume that Noah and his sons relayed the story of God flooding the nations. In each of our families, every one of our families has stories that we pass down through generations. And certainly this is true for all of us in this room. You have some stories from your family history that are important to you that you might tell on special occasions. I remember one of the stories that seemingly our family always shares around every Thanksgiving was that in 1994, my mother made this beautiful Thanksgiving meal but forgot to make gravy. And we repeatedly remind her of the Thanksgiving of 1994 where there was no gravy. It was a serious, catastrophic event in our family history. <laughs> my wife, their family has a bit more meaningful of a story. When my wife was born, her mother had a contraction and was over at a friend's house sitting in a recliner chair, one of those lazy boys. And right when the contraction hit, she grabbed the handles, pushed so hard because of the pain that she flipped out of the chair and flipped backwards and did a somersault. And she said, I'm about to have this baby. And they were rushing to the hospital. She almost had the baby in the car. And I believe it was eight to 12 minutes after getting to the hospital, my wife was born. And the reason my wife came so quickly was that the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck twice and she was in distress and needed to be born right away, and she is a miracle baby. And it is a story that their family recalls and shares down through the generations. They refer back to it. God has flooded the earth. It is a catastrophic event. If I said World War II, we would all remember this, even though many of us didn't live through World War II. If I said the words 9-11, we would recall the life-altering historical event that took place. And so certainly we can assume that Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth have shared with their children, with their grandchildren, how great-grandpa was instructed to build a boat, to build an ark, and God flooded the nations. This would have been a story that was passed down, God blesses Noah and his son, saying, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth, and you will have dominion over all animal life, and God renews his covenant with them. And certainly this story would have been passed down. And so all of mankind in Genesis chapter 10, we can assume, would have an awareness of God because they are all immediate descendants of what has just taken place. 
But we learn in Genesis chapter 11, although we have a spiritual awareness of God, although we have this part of us that longs to be filled with God, the life that was separated from us in Genesis chapter 3 is, is present within us. And although we may even hear the story of the flood, we don't fully know God. There's this deep longing in us to worship. There's a spiritual awareness within all of humanity. But in our sinful nature and in our broken, fallen condition, it sometimes expresses itself in ways that are actually an affront to God. Now, we learn who's behind the building of Babel in Genesis chapter 10. It's an individual by the name of Nimrod. He is the great-grandson of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 10, we learn that he is a great warrior on the face of the earth and a mighty hunter before the Lord. So Nimrod is establishing military rule. It's interesting to note that one of the reasons God flooded the earth was the violence of mankind had become so great, and within a couple generations of cleaning it all up and sending a flood, mankind is back to his sinful ways, being influenced certainly by the father of lies and a murderer from his beginning, Satan influencing mankind and establishing military rule over others. And so even as we have an awareness of God, Nimrod has this awareness that there is a God and that he flooded the earth. Genesis 11 gives us an account of his response to that understanding of who God is. And we are told that there is one language, a common speech amongst all the people at the time. They're moving eastward to where they're going to build this tower, modern day Iraq, near Baghdad, where this is taking place. And they decide to settle there. And because there's no stone to build a city with, let alone a temple with, they start to build with bricks and mortar. And look at what they say. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. As I said to you after the flood, when Noah and his sons come out of the ark, God renews his covenant with his people, and in Genesis 9, verse 1, God says this to Noah and his sons. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase and fill the earth. In verse 7, again, God reiterates his blessing for them. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And so they were instructed, Noah and his sons, to be blessed, to be fruitful, to be multiplied, and spreading out throughout the earth. In Genesis 10, we read of how they were blessed by God to have children and descendants, and certainly did spread out. But here comes Nimrod. He starts to establish a military campaign and starts to build up a Babel. And although he has an awareness of God, maybe even a longing for God, that broken, sinful state called mankind starts to express that spirituality in a tower and in what later becomes known as a Babel. And we know that Babel later becomes Babylon, which plays a prominent role in the Old Testament. When you start to study the gods of the Babylonians and the worship systems that they employed and the temples that they built, it starts to give you some insight as to why God comes down and confuses their language and ends this ambitious building project at the outset. Genesis chapter 11 is the earliest inception in this form of worship where mankind has an awareness of God but doesn't necessarily know how to express that understanding of God, and because of his sinful condition, there's some problems within it. And what is exactly the problem with the tower that they're building? We know from later Babylonian history that it is called a ziggurat, and a ziggurat was a tower that they would build, and the, the greater the God that they were worshiping, the higher the tower. It wasn't uncommon for some of the Babylonian and Assyrian cities, because Nimrod also founded Assyria and Nineveh and other places, for these to have multiple ziggurats, all with the name of a different god attached to them, and a stairway 
to the top of the ziggurat would be built, and at the very top was a room where there was a bed and a, a, a sink so that whatever deity would descend onto the tower would have a place to refresh himself. And it acted as a gateway to the divine. And so as we read their motivation behind this, we see them wanting to build themselves a city with a tower that ascends to the heavens, that reaches to the divine, that brings God down amongst them because of their worship. All of this is rooted in making a name for themselves. Do you see the problem with what they are erecting to God? They are wanting to access the divine, but on their terms and working to bring God down in their midst because of the work of their hands. And all this is rooted to make a name for themselves, not a name for God. Genesis 11 is man's broken effort to worship a God made in his own image. Voltaire, who was a 16th century French philosopher, made the following statement in one of his writings. If God has made us in his image, we have returned the favor. Isn't that true? If God has made us in his image, we have returned the favor. Genesis chapter 11 is about God's mankind who was made in his image that has been marred by sin, that has been broken. Remember the promise that Satan delivered to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You will be like God, and that is certainly within a Nimrod as he establishes his rule and reign and his desire to rise above his fellow man, he is starting to build a monument and a tower to his own great name so that he may make a name for himself and fashion God in his likeness, in his image. We see that rampant throughout our day and age, do we not? The Babel syndrome hasn't gone away. Constantly, as you look over the history of humanity, there is a desire for us to worship God, but in our broken, sinful state, we will build all kinds of constructs by which we explain who God is. And oftentimes, at the base foundation of that construct is a desire for us to make a name for ourselves and bring God down onto our level. As Voltaire said, as God made us in his image, we have returned the favor. I think of all the students here who are gonna be going to university and college in the fall. And let me just warn you that when you get into your classes, you are gonna hear professors that have perfected their arguments about their atheistic beliefs who have perfected their arguments about various philosophies and understandings of the universe. And you need to be aware that the Babel syndrome is even ensconced in our institutions of higher learning. There is a desire in mankind to worship the one true God, but it is broken through our sinfulness and expresses itself in building all kinds of ziggurats, all kinds of temple worship systems that are an affront to who God is as though we can bring him down to our level. And so what is God's response to man's plans? We read in verse five, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible. I actually prefer the New American Standard Bible translation on this verse. It is a more literal word-for-word -word translation. Let me read it to you. The NASB says this in verse six. The Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. It's as though God is looking on his creation and within a couple generations, Noah's great-grandson is building a monument to self. 
And God looks down, and all people are speaking one language, and all people are following Nimrod as he endeavors to build this worship system. And you can almost get the sense that God is saying, I just flooded this place. I just cleaned up the room. I just took care of all this. And here is what man has set his heart to do. And it is because that spiritual life that we lost in the garden, we're longing, but we're longing to fill it. And it's oftentimes with our broken, sinful, man-made systems. And so God says, if this is what they've begun to do, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible. So let's just contrast the two languages between man's plan and God's response and his reply to the plans that man has made in Genesis 11. Man's plans, let us establish ourselves together by building a city, let us ascend to the heavens. Why? To make a name for ourselves. And God looks down and he says, look at what they've begun to do. Nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible. Let us go down and confuse their language. And God does just that, and the city's called Babel. So he goes down and confuses their language, and they are scattered again. God intentionally scatters the nations so that this growing movement of self-worship won't entrench itself and harden itself to God's voice. But when we look over our history, although the people of Babel were scattered throughout the known world, the Babel tendencies, the selfism, the humanistic worship, that longing to know the divine and worship him in a way that is suitable to us manifested itself just as people were scattered. When you survey human history, doesn't matter where you go on the planet, what country you're in, there is some form of worship, spiritual awareness that mankind is trying to populate in and of himself and create systems around. When you think of all the world religions that are throughout the Old Testament alone, whether it was the Egyptians and their pluralistic society, whether it was the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Greeks, whoever it was over church history, man has a longing for the divine, but creates all kinds of systems of worship that are rooted in self, rooted in God conceding to our demands and our ways. And so God writes over all of them, Babel, it's just babbling, it's confusion. There's nothing different today when you look around. There is a multitude of religions that you can choose. There is a menu of options, a multitude of ways in which man has devised the appearance of wisdom, maybe even fine-sounding arguments, but God writes from heaven confusion. We read in Psalm 135, verse 15, the idols of the nations are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is their breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Isn't that telling? But isn't that true in our materialistic society? There is a selfism that pervades Western society rooted in a materialism that wants its own interests at the epicenter of its worship system. And it gives itself to all kinds of silver and gold and idolizes it and becomes subsequently as a worship of it blind to the truth heart of hearing to God's voice, and God writes over it, confused, Babel. And throughout the study of the Old Testament, we see God and his people interacting with Babylon. We see God even using Babylon to exile his people at one point, and his covenant people revealing the one true God to the Babylonians through Daniel, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But there is a stubbornness that set in at Babel, and in Isaiah 14, verses 13 through 15, the prophet Isaiah speaks out against Babylon, 
But what Isaiah says in these verses also indicates that it's not just Nimrod who's a part of this movement. It's not just humanity's best efforts to create a worship system that results in Babel. There are satanic forces at play because when the prophet Isaiah speaks out against Babylon, speaking of Satan, he says this in verse 13, Isaiah 14, 13. You said in your heart, speaking of the enemy, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. It's not just our humanistic tendencies, our selfism that is behind this. There are satanic forces that result in Babels being built all the time throughout human history. And Gordon Wenham, in his commentary, says this of Babel, the name Babel thus stands forever as a reminder of the failure of godless folly. Babylon epitomizes the folly of humanistic culture. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 18 what will be the eventual result of all this Babylonian selfism. This root that we find planted in Genesis chapter 11 runs right through the Old Testament into the book of Revelation to the end of human history. And in Revelation 18, 21, we read this. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. God scatters this movement. God breaks up this movement because left unchecked, it will create such a false worship system that nothing they purpose to do will be impossible for them. And God writes over it confused. But the beautiful thing about God is that in Genesis chapter 12, the very next chapter, God introduces his plan for humanity. Isn't God good? Right after he scatters them so that the hardness of their heart won't set in, in chapter 12, we read in verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, again, a descendant of Noah, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And look at the promise that God makes to Abraham if he's obedient to this and walks by faith. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, if you just took the language of Genesis chapter 11, Nimrod and his cohort, and their desire to build a worship system rooted in themselves that we read about with Isaiah as well, this force behind it, And you contrasted those. Look at man's plan when they're laid beside God's plan. God says to Abram, go from your country, go from your people, go from your family. Abram is being called away from all that he knows so that he might discover God's way and that he might walk in God's way and look at the promise embedded in it. Man's plan, as he's trying to establish a Babel worship system, says, let us establish ourselves. Let us reach to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, and it ends in confusion. And in the next chapter, we read God saying, Abram, leave everything you know, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And it ends in blessing not just for him and his family and his people, for all people on the earth. Do you see what the scriptures are telling us? Let go of your way, however elaborate it is, and what you've erected to self. Let go of your way and follow my way and I will do it. That is the ultimate wrestle for humanity throughout history, is it not? God speaking to his creation, saying, if you would just follow my way, my plans, all would be well. 
But we in our Babylonian desires want to make our own way. And Abram, later to become Abraham, follows God, leaves everything behind, leaves his country, leaves his people, leaves his culture, even leaves his family to follow what God would have for him. Leaves it all behind. And later in the book of Genesis, God enters into a covenant relationship with Abraham and his descendants after him, grants him the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham has children, and the rest of the Old Testament is a progressive revelation of who God is to these covenant people. God revealing himself to mankind, carrying out his plan that was started in Genesis chapter 12 when he said, I will make you into a great nation, I will make your name great, I will bless you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed. God sets that into motion. Abraham gives birth to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. They are held in Egypt, mistreated by Pharaoh. We all know the story of the Exodus. God raises up Moses to set his people free, and in the process of setting his people free, reveals to the whole known world that time, because Egypt was a superpower, that there is only one true God through the 10 plagues, overcomes all of mankind's man-made religious systems, proves the absolute monotheism of God, proves that there is only one God, brings Moses and his covenant people out to Sinai where he gives them his perfect law. We know in Exodus chapter 20, the 10 commandments and the tabernacle and the whole priesthood and the whole law where God reveals his divine wisdom and his perfect holiness and how he desires to be related to. God sets up his system and his form of worship. And does it fix everything for us? Does God's perfect law, his perfect accountability system that's set up with the priests where we have to confess things, does that fix the human condition? Well, when we read through our Old Testament, we know that certainly not. As the Israelites follow God into the desert, their stubborn hearts still have their hearts stuck on the things of Egypt. We see him long-suffering with them. He eventually brings them into the promised land. We see through the monarchy, kings of David and Solomon and others, that God long-suffers with his people over generations, right up to the time of the prophets, but the nation of Israel that knew the one true God, God had revealed himself to the Israelites on Mount Sinai, gave them his perfect, holy, righteous law, made himself known to them. The Israelites, with this perfect revelation, still had this Babylonian tendency within them because they started to carry out the rites and rituals of the worship of God, but would pick and choose which commands were more important than others. It's the equivalent of us today. When we read through certain parts of the Bible, we highlight and under things that we like, and we might just avoid the whole sections of Scripture that speak to the things we don't like. When we do that, sometimes we're trying to fashion God in our own image. And the Israelites have a form of worship, have a form of godliness, have a clear understanding of who he is, but as you read the remainder of the Old Testament, you see that they eventually get to a place where God is so displeased with their lack of law obedience that he has to exile them. And where does God exile them to? Babylon and Assyria, both founded by Nimrod, the one who is wanting to establish his own man-made worship system. See, even God's covenant people who were given his perfect righteous law had this sinful nature within them that made it impossible for them to obey God's law. We are told in Romans 3 that all of mankind is sinful. We have a nature that cannot, will not, and does not submit 
to God's holy law, we all fall short. And when the Israelites had fallen short, when they had so perverted the worship of God and perverted the law, God handed them over to what their heart's desires were and it resulted in them being exiled to confusion. So even when God gives us his perfect revelation, even if we have a divine understanding of who he is, there is still something within us that can't work it out in and of ourselves. What did God say to Abram in Genesis chapter 12? I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. I will bless you. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. As we read throughout the Old Testament, God calls his people out of Egypt, gives them his perfect law, and through Moses, speaks to the fact that one day a great prophet would arise amongst the nation and reveal God's plan of salvation. They were waiting for a Messiah, and that brings us to Acts chapter two. Please turn there now. When we started this series, I talked about how Jesus was crucified during Passover festival. And 50 days prior to Acts chapter two, they had just crucified Jesus. And the Israelites commanded by Jesus to remain in Jerusalem, a place that they probably didn't wanna be just in case they were recognized. Jesus, died on the cross during Passover, by the power of God was raised back to life. He appeared to his disciples over a period of about 40 days. It's been 50 days since that event took place and Jesus left his apostles with one instruction, remain in Jerusalem and wait for in a few days you will be clothed with the spirit and you will be my witnesses. And that sets us up for Acts chapter two and verse one, let's read it. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Do you see what God has brought about? The life that we lost in Genesis chapter three, the spiritual life of God that was taken from humanity because of our sinfulness was restored back to humanity by the one who died on the cross for our sins, was buried in the grave and was resurrected by God's power and the only one who could ascend to heaven and send the very thing that they are now witnessing. Isn't God amazing? What Acts chapter two, the first verses are telling us is that our own man-made worship systems that Nimrod and the others were establishing in Genesis chapter 11 resulted in confusion and God had to scatter humanity because nothing in which they had purpose to do would be impossible. They would have their hearts so set on their way that they may be hardened to God's way. And God implements his plan in Genesis chapter 12 through Abraham. And as God scatters 
in Genesis 11, through his covenant people, God gathers everyone from every nation under heaven to reverse what he had implemented in Genesis chapter 11. Thousands of years later, God reverses his actions, and why does he reverse them? So that every language, every people, everyone who would be gathered in Jerusalem would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God has made one way for salvation, one way in which he wants humanity to relate to him. God gathers everyone and reverses the curse, gives them a common language so that they can hear the praises of God. And I guarantee you from Peter's uh, message that we're gonna read next week, I guarantee you that the praises of God they hear is about the apostles in the language of all the people praising God for what Jesus had done on the cross for their salvation. God has gathered every culture, every people, every tribe, every language, every tongue to Jerusalem. He has implemented this plan over the course of thousands of years of human history, long suffered with all the Babels that we've erected since that time. But on Acts chapter two, the very day of Pentecost, declares to humanity, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one way in which you are to relate to me, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It is not a choose your own adventure spirituality that we get to implement in our lives. God has established this person, Jesus Christ, as the savior of the world and he longs to have a relationship with all of us, with every human under heaven, but he will not conform to our ways. And our ways inevitably lead to confusion. They lead to Babel. And they have an inevitable end. And even for those who God did reveal himself to through his perfect law, his covenant people, even when God established his righteous ways because of our sinful fallenness, we could never live up to his holiness. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why he died on the cross for us, and he is the only man in history that could ascend to the heavens and bring about the restoration that we needed. Only Jesus could send the life that we lost back to us, and it could only be secured by his finished work on the cross. It has absolutely nothing to do with us. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Acts 2 is about God gathering all the nations and declaring his fulfilled plan of salvation that he introduced from the very outset after the flood when mankind tried to establish his own ways. Now, next week, we will go into Peter's sermon. It will be a gospel message where we fully understand all that Christ did on our behalf. But I wanna ask you today, you might be here today, you might just be visiting. I wanna ask you, are you living in Babel? Or have you been baptized into Christ? Are you trying to establish your own way to God, build your own tower, your own worship system to God? And maybe for the first time today, you've heard that he had a plan all along to reveal himself to us, a plan to illustrate to us that we could never satisfy his holiness, even when he gave us his perfect law and his perfect righteousness, we would fall short of it, and that his intended purpose from the moment that sin entered the human condition was to send the Christ to save us. I just wanna ask you today, if you're in that place and it's just dawning on you, that you need Jesus, please, please, please speak to your friend who brought you to church, speak to any person you know that knows Jesus because his offer still stands. He has set a way in which he wants to be reconciled with you and send his Holy Spirit, that spirit we lost, the life of Christ, to live and dwell in each one of us. When we read accounts of idolatry in the Bible, we may think we would never consider such a rebellion against God. Why would we want to build a tower to bring ourselves acclaim? 
but it can be more subtle for us. Perhaps we also try to fashion God in our own image by just picking the bits of the Bible that we like and not those that challenge us or go against the mood of our culture. Perhaps we try to make Jesus just a little more palatable to those around us who might take offense at some of his words. What is wonderful about the reversal of the Babel curse at Pentecost is that our rebellion no longer needs to bring confusion and division. We don't need to try to manufacture unity around a tower. We're reunited with God and with one another through Christ. That's been God's plan all along. The Book of Acts chronicles the amazing growth of the early church, giving us a glimpse into the purpose of the church in the world. Acts helps us to understand how the church grew from a small gathering of disciples in the Gospels into something that pervaded the whole known world, and that Jesus continues to teach through his body, the church. This series by Brett McBride is available on CD and DVD. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order your series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text by to our toll-free number. This summer, experience the transforming power of God's Word. Contact us today. In Genesis 11, we read about a group of people building a tower to the heavens. But we get to eavesdrop on their actual motive, to make a name for themselves. And unfortunately, we know this is not the last time that humanity attempts to do something for God that actually has a selfish and prideful motive. Would you agree that this is an issue that we still face today, that sometimes we try to do things for God but really there is a you know, selfish motive behind it? Oh, I think we are, we are so into our own self-worship. We, you know, we are the gods we make and, and this whole trend, and that, that has caused, I think, most of the world's problems down through the years, uh, pretending there is no God. We'll, we'll step in, and, mm -hmm. and we do a miserable job of it, by the way. Yeah, you know. yeah absolutely. I, I think most of the time now, if people are interested in God, which I think they are, I think deep down there is that desire for something more, for a spiritual side to their life, but they don't want it to be a God who's very clear about who he is and, and as revealed in scripture. They, mm -hmm. they would like to create a God that suits mm. them. And, mm -hmm. and I think even we do that as well. I don't think it's just people who, who wouldn't call themselves Christians. I think as Christians, we can sometimes decide well, I, I'd like God to be a bit more like this. Mm -hmm. This would be more convenient. Um, I like this in scripture. I'm not sure about that. So it's, it's very easy for us to do those things. Mm -hmm. So that almost sounds like um, making a faith that is more about us than about God. So the evidence is in life without God sucks, but all kinds of ways have been tried and they fail eventually. They, I think they start out well-meaning. Mm -hmm. I'm sympathetic to people who, you know, they want to make things better. Yeah. But they think that, you know, we can make things better, mm -hmm. but by ignoring God, you never make things better in the long run. Mm -hmm. So how can we test our own motives when we do something for God? I suppose you, you really always need to be testing it by scripture. So um, if your emphasis has started to come away from from Christ and from him being at the center of what you're doing. Um, I think that's very easy for that to happen. Um, I, I think, is this about me? Am I becoming more concerned with people's opinion about me and whether everyone's with me? If it is about yourself, you're much more worried about your image than, than about the work of God, I think. Mm -hmm. I think how you handle your critics and people who offer suggestions it, it, it will, will determine the success of your mission and I, I, I think, although we're all individuals, we, we are all part of one another. And, and I don't have unique needs that you don't have. And I agree with you searching scripture, but if it's just scripture alone, you, you can take that out of context yes. and say, this verse says I should do this. And it's like, whoa, hold everything. And you know, you, you, you don't, don't listen to that person because they don't know what I know about God. And, and so we, we, we separate ourselves from the people that can help us. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. a problem. 
How would you attempt to explain the moral of this brief story? There's actually not a lot written, but it sort of says a lot. Life without God does not work, I guess. Um, and while, while you ad admire the tenacity, and that took a lot of work to, to do that and build the biggest uh, uh, tower up to that point, um, by excluding God, there are unintended consequences. And, and he saw this for what it was. We all build our miniature Tower of Babels well-meaning, I think it starts out well-meaning, but it eventually is judged by the circumstances of life. It, will, it, will, it was never meant to work and cannot work without God's plan. Yes, and, and really that God always has the best plan. Hmm. Because if, when you look at the whole story of Babel and how it connects then to Pentecost, it's that God had a plan Mm -hmm. to, to bring everyone together, but it had to be mm -hmm. his way, not yeah. through a tower. We're not going to bring everyone into unity mm -hmm. um, through building this huge tower mm -hmm. under Nimrod. Yeah. Um, it has mm -hmm. to be, mm -hmm. it had to be through Christ. So it's trusting the plan of God mm -hmm. at a time where perhaps you think you have a better idea. Uh, there's a lot of times in my own faith journey where it hasn't been so clear. You know, like we, when we read scripture, says, and God said, and the Lord spoke, and it seems really clear. Yeah. I know for myself, sometimes about a decision or next steps, it hasn't always been that clear. Mm -hmm. So for others who may be struggling in that place, how would you advise them to discern, you know, God's plan? So it's just step by step, and you, you often don't get the whole picture. So you you have to trust the small things. I think you have to start moving. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sort of, I'm just going to wait and wait and wait and wait until I see the neon sign. That's not really what happens. Abram had to get up and go and leave, even though he did not know where he was going. Mm -hmm. So yes. there, is a, there is a get moving and God will show you as you move. So I, yes. generally that's been a principle I think I've seen in my life. Mm -hmm. I think he actually tells us in many different ways. The problem is we're not listening. And that's, that's on us, because I don't think God is playing games like we're little mice in, in a maze. And mm -hmm. No, God communicates us and, and, with us, and, and learning to listen to Him is what life, and especially the Christian life, is all about. And that's why we need each other, because you can help me to understand that in some ways, and I can help you. Yeah, I appreciate that reminder. I think it is important that we have other people we are in community mm. and you know, people can help us yes, discern the absolutely. voice of God in our lives. Yeah. There was a time in history where mankind attempted to build a tower to reach the heavens, to get to God. The good news is that the God we serve chose to come down to us over 2,000 years ago. Emmanuel is God with us and his spirit continues to reside with us today. It really is incredible to me. It can be a challenge for us to keep following God's way and not our own. We're often tempted to make this journey about us rather than about the God we serve. But what an awesome picture at Pentecost, God gathering all the nations and declaring the truth about the risen Christ and our redemption through him. It's God's plan for the whole world. Let's remain mindful and celebrate in the power and majesty of the gospel and how it is for every nation, tribe, and tongue on this earth. Join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts, you can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Join us next week for more clear biblical teaching from Brett McBride.
Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.